what a day! What a lovely day! <laughs> Welcome to the Mad Max Minute Podcast, the daily podcast where we break down Mad Max one minute at a time. I'm Rick. And I'm Julia. And today we're talking about Minute 62, which begins with the local sheriff on the phone, and it ends with the arrival at May's farmhouse. So we fade up from black, and we see this sheriff guy talking on the phone. He's got like this big orange handset held up against his head. And we don't necessarily get his name until later in the minute, but because we're going through this minute by minute and doing all this research, we know ahead of time that this is a character named Ziggy. Uh, I'm not sold. <laughs> so we know it. his name is Ziggy because... Because the, the credits said so? Exactly. It's just like Clunk. We know his name is Ziggy because the credits say so. Uh, okay. Yeah. What's funny about this guy... Wait, IMDb says so? No, or the, the credits of the movie. the actual rolling credits of the movie the say so? The actual rolling credits of the movie. Okay, well then I have to agree. Yeah. I guess. Yeah. I can fight IMDb because they've been wrong before, but <laughs> can't fight the movie itself. <laughs> so, in the crew commentary, when this guy comes on screen, they're like, oh, hey, it's Jerry Day. Uh, was he a family friend? And they're like, oh, I think he was he must have been which is kind of funny to me because i jumped on his imdb page and i found his top four and the movie titles on his top four are going to sound very surprising until i explain why they're on there so number one for jerry day is the big lebowski in 1998 uh Number two is The Lost World Jurassic Park in 1997. Uh, Glee is number three, which is the 2009 to 2014 TV show of, you know, the uh, high schoolers singing and whatnot. And then number four is Austin Powers' International Man of Mystery from 1997. And you hear that list of movies and you're like, wait a second, why isn't Jerry Day a bigger movie star? And the answer is... Because he worked behind the scenes in the camera and electrical department as a rigging grip or just a regular key grip on the movie. And the various grip positions are ones that tend to get lightly made fun of a bit because nobody knows what they do. <laughs> so I took the extra step. I jumped on a website called howtofilmschool.com where they have a page specifically all about working as a key grip. And some of the responsibilities that that job includes are... The key grip executes the cinematographer's wishes in order to shape and control the light, execute and or facilitate any camera movement or rigging. This includes dollies, cranes, or camera placement, and rigging on any stationary, moving, or floating object. Run the grip crew. This can include grips with specific specialties like dolly grips, crane operators, rigging grips, etc. Work with the gaffer and translate requested lighting positions and needs into rigging options and equipment needs. Uh, crew safety, although on larger sets, the first assistant director mainly deals with safety. Uh, think ahead and keep an eye out for any problems that may arise. This includes having equipment standing by for close-ups, relights, and solving issues before or as they arise. So it's a lot of work making the cinematographer's job easier. Yes, it, it sounds like there's a lot of anticipating needs mm -hmm. and knowing what the planned shots are coming up. Mm -hmm. So that you're prepared to make the changes. Yeah. When you watch behind the scenes documentaries, every time they have like a track laid out on the ground mm -hmm. that the camera is rolling along, or if the camera is ever up on a crane or something, it's the grip's job to make sure all of that is in place. So that way when the cinematographer gets behind the camera, they're ready to go and nothing is falling apart. Yes. It's all about making sure that, like you said, needs are anticipated. Yeah. Interesting. Yep. All right. Thank you. I had no idea. Yeah. It's, it's when you think of the technical aspects of the job, it's a pretty cool position to be in. It's just rather thankless to the general public because all of your work, all of it is behind the camera. Yes. And your, and the fruits of your labor is making the movie and the stars in the movie look good. Yeah. Because without any of the grips, you don't get dolly shots. You don't get, like, all you would have is pan, tilt, and zoom. Those are the only type of camera shots you would get without a grip. Yes. Like, these guys are basically facilitating all of the modern shooting practices that you see in movies. Yes. You know. <laughs> 
it's it's pretty cool. Uh, in front of the camera, Jerry Day still has five acting credits. Just none of them show up in his top four. Um, he was in From Here to Eternity in 1979. Oh. He played a character named Soldier Red. Um, I never, I've never, i never seen From Here to Eternity. I just know that one iconic scene of the two characters on the beach. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Never actually went through and sat through the whole thing. Uh, obviously, he's in Mad Max. He's in another movie called Cave Girl in 1985, where he played crew chief. He was in 1986's Say Yes as Simmons. There's a lot of S's in that last one. And finally, in 2000, he was in Terror Tract as Robert Goodwin in the Come to Granny segment. So that kind of sounds like one of those anthology horror movies where they mm. have a bunch of smaller stories yeah and that's jerry day okay starting off as i guess someone's friend on the production yeah came in did one little speaking part yep and launched his career in movies so to speak what really stood out to me in this shot though aside from this new character is the fact that he's talking on this big orange like handset phone thing yeah it's kind of odd because this is the first time we've seen a phone like that in a car yes and I mean, you you think back and you know, like in the 80s, everybody had a phone in their car and they were these big clunky things, mm -hmm. you know, and if they were mobile, they were like the size of a shoebox or something like that. I'm exaggerating. They were a little bit, about half the size of a shoebox. Like the size of a shoe? Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But the idea of having a phone in a car, according to techwalla.com, in 1910, an engineer from Stockholm, Sweden named Lars Magnus Ericsson, you know, like Ericsson phones. Really? I think like... so. Oh, okay. He installed a telephone in his car, and as he drove around the country, he would pull off to the side of the road and connect his phone with a pair of long electrical wires into the telephone poles installed along the road. <laughs> I love this idea. I think it's genius because it's just like cell phones work now. As you move around the country, they connect to the nearest cell phone tower. And they just go from tower to tower to tower as you're moving around. He's doing the exact same thing, just mm -hmm. physically with wires. Yeah, it must have looked really ridiculous to have him get out of his car, probably take a really long wooden pole, attach right? it to one end to the wire, and then lift the wire up to cap it over the telephone line. Yeah. Which... Maybe he traveled with his own linemen. I see. That'd be really a lot safer than what I was <laughs> suggesting. Because, I mean, around us, a lot of the lines that are stringed up between the houses and along the roads, like, it's power. Like, there is telephone lines running alongside them. But if but you nick a power in. line... Right. You, you know. need to know... <laughs> You need to know what, what you're connecting into. Which lines into. are which. Yeah. Yeah. Because otherwise, you wouldn't be making too many more phone calls. No. Certainly not. No. But the idea of being able to take a phone on the go with you, hmm. I mean, that that concept is a huge part of our society, our modern society. Mm -hmm. And I find it fascinating that it was th first thought of over 100 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> and it was implemented like... Did it work? Like, did, how long was it in his car? Did he use it? Well, it didn't take off popular with the general public because of the need to stop and right. I wouldn't your car imagine. I I kind of think of it as an eccentric millionaire type device. Yeah, but the work with putting phones into cars led to things like police radios and whatnot. That technology working slowly towards having an actual phone system. And I think once satellites started going up into space, that's where we really saw a lot of expansion in the cellular phone technology. Yes. Yeah. What's interesting about the car that he's calling from, though, is that we never see it move. And at the end of this <laughs> minute, he, like, walks them back to their van. And, like, is that car his car? Does he drive it? Because we never see it move. So it could be that this car is more like a car-shaped phone booth. <laughs> Like, I, I just don't know. There's there's questions that don't get answered. Yes. Well, that would explain why it's like a typical home handset <laughs> that he's holding rather than like a police radio. Yeah. Yeah. Because he's definitely got a solid connection there. It's just funny to think that way. Yes. Going back to the minute, we can definitely tell looking at him in this initial shot that he is a member of law enforcement. And given the style of hat that he wears, I really interpret that as him being the local sheriff. 
the local law enforcement guy because he's wearing the same coat as the MFP officers. He's yes. just more lax with yeah, his uniform. Yeah, he's... Uh, I think it's the difference... Well, a couple of differences. One, that he's a rural cop, a mm. rural sheriff. He's out there on his own. Maybe a couple of other guys. He's kind of making his own rules, especially as far as... Uh, uniform goes yeah but also you know in our in our modern police system there are different jurisdictions that have their own uniforms exactly him being out more in the bush like it would make sense for him to have a wide brim hat and lighter pants because if he's out in the hot beating sun all day making house calls and whatnot yeah you don't want to be wearing vinyl (laughs) right (laughs) so as we mentioned he's talking on the phone here and you got the sense that he's just kind of play acting on the phone oh definitely it's totally fake there's no one on the other side of that feeding him lines or anything like that no because he's not pausing for enough time for someone to actually say something on the other end Mm -hmm. especially not what it's implied he's responding to so yeah he's he's totally faking (laughs) (laughs) so which is before you move on which is interesting because this movie does not have any problem with taking its time with scenes. Mm-hmm. We we see plenty of times where we get a true sense of how much time something is taking. So why not slow him down a little bit so that we get the sense that there actually is somebody talking on the other end of the phone? Right. Taking like five seconds. Or give us some sort of like muted dialogue that kind of sounds like the phone is really loud. Yeah. So you can kind of hear even like just like a Charlie Brown wah, 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 type of thing. <laughs> To give us some implication that someone else on the other end of that phone is talking. Yeah. Do you think that's why he's on a handset rather than the radio? That or... way they don't have to record another side? Yes. Yeah. I think that's exactly why. <laughs> <laughs> so he gets off the phone and he's not worried. Yeah. And he says, I'm not worried. They're not worried. They, I suppose, is headquarters. Mm. Whoever his boss is. Yeah, because Max... Sees him get off the phone and Max is like, take it you agreed with him. And Ziggy says exactly what you said. And I get the sense that the him and they that these two are referring to are MFP headquarters back in the city. Because I feel like that big of a building is probably kind of a hub for the other officers and sheriffs in the general area. My only question would be how far their reach is. Mm-hmm. I, we haven't really talked about how long this whole scene takes. Yeah. Since since them leaving their house, how long has it been? We yeah. haven't really talked about that because we get no hints. But even if it was an entire day's drive north, I feel like that would at least, that would take them out of the MFP that we have seen. I feel like it would take them out of their area yeah. of authority and into a different MFP headquarters area of authority. Yeah. And I think it's been more than one day. I think it's been a couple of days at least. Yeah. I don't know. I, I, I kind of get the feeling that it's, that the reach of MFP headquarters is pretty wide just because it's sort of a regional thing. Because it's so sparse. You know, that that's just where the main building is. And that, yeah, they have four or five officers to cover that one little area. But then, you know, they have the satellite locations. Right. You know. Okay. I mean, it's never, it's never said right out how the MFP is structured to cover the entirety of the area that they cover. And it's especially not sectioned out, like you said, of exactly how far their reach is. But I think, I want to say it's this far out specifically because of the jacket. Okay. Because it is that same because style of same jacket. jacket. That is the kind of the unifying detail between Ziggy and the other officers we've seen. Okay. I Just because it is so specific. Disagree with you. Because that's the only piece of uniform that is the same. Mm-hmm. Everything else is different. Yeah. So I think it's a different jurisdiction with their own uniform code. Okay. Yeah, I'm just saying that like it's a different area, but I still think they report back to, to uh, MFP headquarters. They're a satellite location. So do you think MFP headquarters that we have seen is covers the entirety of Australia? That's kind of what I'm saying. That I very disagree with that. I think it covers Melbourne's in Victoria, correct? Yeah. I think it covers Victoria. But I think they're still in Victoria. I mean, they're still definitely in Victoria because that's where all they filmed it. But Well, no, in in movie. Well, that's hard to say because living in New England versus living in Australia, we have absolutely no sense of scale 
for Australia. That's true. The states up in our area are very small. I mean, you know, six hours takes us to Washington, D.C. practically. Yeah. It only takes us four hours to get to New York City. So, I mean, and that just isn't the case in Australia. It takes a long time to get places. Yeah. It's big. All right. So I, I think because we don't have a sense of scale, we have we can have no idea yeah. how much area a large central hub office would cover. Yeah, I don't know. I was just trying to trying to make some sort of connection to try and figure out who he was talking to. I think he's talking to his own version of Fifi. Okay. I think so. it's Fifi, but it's not Fifi. Okay. So it's like it's yeah, I think it's his own version of Fifi. Okay. Wonder if he I wonder what he's like. Well he's not as fabulous as Fifi. That's true. That's true. Like a countryfied version of Roger Ward. <laughs> okay, back to the minute. Anyway, so obviously Max and Ziggy are not super concerned about the situation. Jesse, on the other hand, motions to the fact that Ziggy is holding a plastic bag with a severed hand inside and says, well, what about that? <laughs> She's definitely more worried than the other two. Mm-hmm. The other two are completely ready to maybe brush it aside as too casual a word. Mm-hmm. But they feel reassured by being reassured by whoever was on the phone. Yeah. And in their own conversation, they are reassuring each other. And they're cool with that. Jesse is not. Yeah. So as far as the dialogue is concerned, Ziggy responds to Jesse by saying, I figure it's lost property. If no one makes a claim on it, I say we can forget it. So Max says, sounds okay to me, Jess. And Jess is like, I, I don't know. And I get the sense that she hasn't really told Max exactly what she went through. Yes. I know I brought it up yesterday, but... This is definitely a piece of evidence in that argument. Yeah. That her concern is probably more accurate mm-hmm. than Max's because Max doesn't know the extent of what happened. Yeah, she he probably doesn't realize... how thorough the threat was. <laughs> he probably doesn't realize how many there were mm-hmm. or how aggressive they were or how they chased her as soon as she tried to drive away. Yeah. And... The whole idea that Ziggy is going to hold on to this hand in a bag to see if anyone comes looking for it. Is yeah, I thought just... that was... I mean, that's what he's supposed to do. Yeah. So he does it. And that's, you know... It's just so one, ridiculous. <laughs> one of the marks of a good officer is you do what you're supposed to do, even if it seems ridiculous. Yeah. That if Kundalini were in a position where he felt comfortable going to the cops to claim a hand... He would also feel comfortable going to a hospital Mm -hmm. to get care for his life-threatening wound. Yeah. Neither of which he does. So the hand is just there. It's a formality. They're hanging on to it because it's lost property and that's what they're supposed to do. Yeah. It's just weird that... Got a hand and a bag on ice. Yeah. It's just an odd thing to have. And you, you hit the nail right on the head. There's no way that Kundalini would ever show up at a police station. That's assuming that he could even figure out what police station it would be held at. Right. Because at this point, they haven't found them anyway. So they yeah. wouldn't know where to go to reclaim a hand. So it's just later on, they show up looking for the hand. And it's like, well, the hand is with Ziggy. And yeah. it's like, they wouldn't know I mean, that. And it's like, Jesse wouldn't necessarily... What do they think they're going to do with the hand? Yeah, it's like... I mean, it's too little too late. You wrap some duct tape around it and try and get it back on it. It's like, I don't know. That's It's definitely a discussion for a later minute. Yes. Because we got to stay focused up. on what we're talking about today. But <laughs> I, uh, just the whole idea of the hand in the bag. Yeah, which doesn't seem to bother Ziggy much. No. He's just... Hold it in his hand and it's there and that's fine. It's just another day for him. Yes. So. So Jesse says, I don't know. Yeah. She's very unsure. And then Ziggy reassuring Jesse says, if Ziggy says it's okay, it's okay. Yeah. Talking to himself in the third person. Okay. And this caused some problems for me, which is why I questioned his name being Ziggy. Mm Mm-hmm. Because I wrote down the two options. Either his name is Ziggy and he's talking about himself in the third person. Or the much more likely scenario is that the person who was on the phone was Ziggy. Mm -hmm. Which context would dictate that option being the right one. Yes. And my notes clearly say that it is most likely the right one. The other one would be more interesting, but... In reality, we don't know this cop's name, and he was talking to some higher up named Ziggy. Mm-hmm. Maybe it's his own Fifi. Now, as his we name Ziggy. Now, as we but talked about earlier, because the of the movie credits, credits, say his name is Ziggy. So I have to concede. Yeah, I'm not a big fan of people referring to themselves in the third person. I think it's kind of ridiculous. Yeah, like. <laughs> I... <laughs> 
Like, this is the only instance where we hear his name, aside from seeing it in the credits. And I gotta wonder, as far as movies are concerned, do you get more money if you're an actor in a movie and your character has a name? I don't think the named part is the important part. I think it's the lines. Yeah. Yeah. That it, I think the pay scale changes whether or not you have lines. Yeah. Because I feel like if he wanted to get more money out of the production. He or named he, himself. He like name dropped himself. Yeah. <laughs> like that is exactly what it feels like. Like he was given a script and he was given the words. Maybe the original phrasing was, you know, you know, you can trust me. It's okay. Or something like that. And then yeah. he said, well, you know, I want my character to have a name. So he changed it to, if Ziggy says so, believe me, it's okay. It's like it's sneaky and it's something quick you can do. And I mean, the movie's on a tight budget. Okay. You know? So they, the ability to go back and do reshoots. <laughs> like, well, it was well acted. So we're going to go with it. Yeah. Okay. I have another theory that I just thought up. Okay. Okay, so in the next moment after he names himself, we see that he has put his arm around Jesse. Mm -hmm. And we see everybody's comfortable with that. Mm -hmm. So that tells us that he knows Jesse personally. I think that perhaps Jesse grew up in this area. Yeah, because... Maybe she grew up with May. The dialogue goes on to say, if Ziggy says so, believe me, it's okay. May's expecting you up at the farm sometime tomorrow. You'll have no more troubles up there, just green grass. Yes. So it wasn't a question. He already knew that they were coming and that, and that May knows they're coming tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So there's a sense of familiarity. So perhaps Ziggy is using his own name to reiterate their connection. Like, you know me, I'm Ziggy. We've known each other a long time and you know you can trust me. Yeah. Almost like his real name isn't Ziggy. Ziggy is a nickname that she would recognize being a local to the area. Yes, I think so. So I, I think that he's using his his history with her, his familiarity with her, and his trust going both ways to reassure her. That makes a lot of sense. That this everything's going to be okay. Yeah, because the name Ziggy outside of newspaper cartoons is just... What's it? I mean, what's it a name. nickname for? I... Siegfried? Perhaps. Kind of is, a German sounding Yeah, name. which isn't very Australian. I'm not saying that Germans never live in Australia, but I don't, I just don't know of any other name that could be brought down to Ziggy as a nickname off the top of my head. <laughs> my mom was telling me about a book and I can't remember who it was by or what the name was, but it was about a German doctor, I think it was after World War II, moved to Australia to kind of start anew. And he couldn't work as a doctor because his license wasn't recognized mm -hmm. in Australia. So he was working at Lumber? He was working in a lumber, lumber mill. mill. Okay. Yeah. So that's one example of a German living in Australia. <laughs> From fiction, but... Yeah. Yeah. Like I said, <laughs> it's entirely possible. Yeah. Nowhere near out of the question. Yeah. So I think he's driving home their familiarity and that she can trust him. I agree. I agree. Because the next thing we see is them driving along Country Road and then arriving at May's farmhouse. Yes. And the music is very much building tension here. Yes. It has been during the scene with Ziggy. It continues with the drive, the drive up the driveway. And it it makes me feel like the farmhouse is a dangerous place. Mm -hmm. Or which, that there's danger around it. Yes. Which right now I feel like is not how we're supposed to feel. We're supposed to feel like they have arrived at their destination. They can feel safe here. Ziggy told us. That we can feel safe here. So I guess it's that's just a part of, you know, the art of filmmaking. Mm -hmm. Is that we are told that we are supposed to feel safe here. But the music disagrees with that. Yeah. Conflicting messages. Yes. That so that puts us it puts us off. We don't know what's going to happen here. Mm. And the whole place, it kind of looks a little dark. Mm -hmm. Just because it just it's doesn't... It's run down. It's and, not clean. Yeah. I mean, it definitely speaks to the world that we... The, the world that Max and Jesse live in, where it's not quite post-apocalyptic. There is society left. There's plenty of society left. Yes. Yeah. It's just maybe not up to... Just not quite up to snuff. Yeah. Things aren't quite it's, as gold and shiny. going downhill. Yeah. But it's still there. Yeah. So we get a really long shot of this building. And I tried to find kind of where it is. And I'm about to say the name of a town. It's not going to be correct. But I'm going to say it just how I feel like to say it. <laughs> our, uh, our unofficial cultural liaisons will do their due diligence and let me know in the comments. 
how to pronounce it, but that'll come later. So the house is said to have stood off of Ridley Road in Mickleham, uh, west of the Hume Highway, but all of the Google Earth shots are no help. Just because the area is so built up, you know, modern development and whatnot, the address that I found specifically is 100 Ridley Road, but that's currently the home of the Hume Anglican Grammar School. I do have my suspicions that one of the buildings they use for the school is the renovated and refitted version of this farmhouse. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. There's one shot in particular I was able to find as I was looking on Google Maps. Click on the grammar school, one of the first pictures that pops up. It just looks similar enough to the farmhouse that we see in the movie to maybe be okay. the same building. Okay. But, I mean, there's no way for us to know for sure without going right. to Australia. <laughs> right, because they're not going to put too many detailed pictures of a grammar school online. Exactly. There's no street view driving through the campus right. <laughs> or anything like that. <laughs> yep. That would be so off base. So off base. So, But this is where we're going to be for the next several days. Yes. So in the meantime, our website is madmaxminute.com. You can follow us on Twitter at Mad Max Minute. Like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash madmaxminute. And we now have a listeners page, which you can find on Facebook. Just search for Mad Max Minute Beyond Microphone. And we'll see you there. Thank you for joining us for Mad Max Minute number 62. We'll see you tomorrow. Motorbikes and men. Hey!